This video we're going to be talking about medical risk and eating disorders. Anorexic sufferers are the highest risk in terms of their own safety. It has the highest mortality rate of any other mental health illness and there are a staggering 20% of people who die as a direct result from their illness or through suicide. We're going to be talking about a BMI as a guideline. What BMI means is body mass index. In today's society you'll find everything a body mass index going up the high rate but you'll find very little information available for a body mass index that actually is on the downward scale. A body mass index is a ratio of weight and height and it's a proxy measure of medical risk in anorexia. It is inadequate as a standalone marker. It is not critical with regards to risk association to fluid or electrolytes such as potassium level. The recommendation are that a BMI calculation be, should be a combination of muscle strength, blood pressure, pulse rate, peripheral circulation and core body temperature. Just to reiterate, a BMI should not be a standalone assessment. It does not take into account whether that person is male or female. It doesn't take into account their age range. Whilst a BMI is a good indicator as to what level a person is at in terms of mild, moderate, severe, critical or life-threatening, it would perhaps be as well to use a child centre growth development child for a younger person. So I just wanted to make that clear from the onset. So it's not a standalone assessment, but it's a guideline. Anything between 18.5 and 20 are the national guidelines for a healthy BMI. As we go down from 17.5 to 18.5 would be considered underweight. From 17.5 to 15, this would be considered anorexia nervosa. Severe anorexia would be between 15 and 13.5. Critical anorexia, where organs may be compromised, would be between 13.5 and 12, and anything below 12 could be life-threatening. What we mean by mild, moderate, severe or critical life-threatening levels? It's a, it's a basic guideline, and somebody who had a mild eating disorder would perhaps be still going to school or going to work and, and continuing activities on a day-to-day -day basis. It would always be advised that a GP was still involved in your care. It may be that counselling may be offered to you as a, as a form of intervention. It may be that you are seeking help through self-help. If someone is moderate, suffering from anorexia or bulimia, then definitely your GP should be still involved in their care. But you may need to step it up a little bit. And it may be that CBT may be an intervention, as well as perhaps GP oversight, self-help, counselling. However, when things get down to the lower end, when severe anorexia or bulimia is evident, you need much, much more closer monitoring by the GP. It may be that psychology or psychiatry is involved, and it may be that there is an element of self-help. When somebody gets down to the more severe end and then to the critical end of the scale, without any shadow of doubt there will be no intervention um, in terms of therapy. They would maybe be in an inpatient unit, they may be in a hospital or they may be trapped within a mental health unit. If somebody is life-threatening, then without any shadow of doubt there will be in something like a royal or one of the, the general infirmaries. Their priority is to stabilise them medically and it may be that they have to be tube fed for this to happen. If the compensatory behaviours are out of control, then the potassium levels drop. A normal potassium level would be between 3.5 and 5.2. Anything below 3 would normally be hospitalised. So that is really, really important because if the potassium levels are low, then it could cause problems with the rhythm of the heart. It's vitally, vitally important that people understand that.
we do have a document available through SEED which is called Keeping Safe and What You Should Know and this again is available on our website.